Hi, I'm Dan Ming. And I'm Max DeLeo. And we are going to show you how we like to work at the Rialto. So here we have a Venice 2 body and a Venice 2 Rialto, and we're going to put them together and do a really bare bones rig like we like to do with like car rigs and then Top Gun and um, basically completely strip it down to the bare essentials. And then uh, on the opposite side of that, we have also a Venice 2 body with a Rialto. And we're showing you what we often do with the Rialto system, which is we build a backpack for a lightweight handheld mode for a run and gun or sometimes even for hard to reach places in different rigs. This is uh, another setup that we find common. So the first time we used the Rialto was at the very beginning of Top Gun. We needed a way to get six cameras into the cockpit of the F-18s and we had tried all sorts of ways to cram the cameras into the jets, very creative ways. And then uh, Sony said like, well, if we do these extensions, will it work? And that was what we needed to be able to get the cameras in the way we got them in. So what we did was we had Venice Ones. We had to shoot S by S only because on the Venice Ones, the access deck was an additional deck which made the cameras too long. So we had Venice Ones and then we had three of these on the bottom and then we had one Rialto on top facing the back seat here. And then in the front on the canopy as it came down, we had two cameras rigged facing forward to look over the shoulder of the pilot. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert this to Rialto mode kind of the way we did on Top Gun. One thing we like to do, which I don't know if it's necessarily approved of by Sony is we do not put these two screws in because frequently you have a base plate here and to take the sensor block off you end up having to disassemble everything on the bottom just so you could take the sensor block off. So Max and I, when we're going to be going back and forth from Rialto's, we like to like leave these two screws off down here so that usually when it's on a head, you can just pop these four screws off and take the sensor block off. So We found that it saved us a few minutes and on set a few minutes mean everything. So that was very helpful to us to just leave it off and didn't compromise anything. So we're gonna we're gonna convert it now. So in Top Gun we had two jets we had a rig. So we had six Sony Venices for each jet, plus we had four additional Sony Venices for the external jet rigs. Which was on a third jet most of the time. Which was on a third jet most of the time. So we tried to make it so we don't have, didn't have to convert that much by, you know, making it up by volume of cameras we had. So, because frequently there was no time to convert. To, for us to, conv to build the cameras in the jets took us about Three, two to three days. Two to three days, depending. Each time we did it, and we had to do it like um, four times, five yeah, times. Yeah, on that movie, we the schedule was constantly in flux, so we typically would build it and then derig. Yeah, Dan and I would each basically split up in the beginning and each do a jet, and it took us about two days, two and a half days, to get a jet completely rigged but it took months of preparation leading up to that to test the cameras and Navy had to approve absolutely every rig and every mount that we had. Um, and so it was a long process. Now, so on Top Gun, we were fighting for every centimeter. So we decided to use the E-mounts on the camera because the back of the lens gets very close to the sensor, so it minimizes how much depth you are adding to the camera, and also the lenses were small. So between the combination of the two, we just went with the E-mounts. So now I'm removing the six screws to take the mount off, and the E-mounts are also built into the body. So when you take off all the, whatever lens adapter you have on. Yeah, so the two lenses we used on Top Gun were uh, Voigtlander. Um, we did use that for mostly our wide lenses, and then we used the uh, Zeiss Loxia for our tighter lens. Um, we needed something that was spatially gonna fit because uh, with an ejection, there is a very small amount of space that you would need to clear. And so we need to make sure our lenses, uh, let's do the Voigtlander, 
were going to clear um, where the pilot would be ejecting. And what you'll see here is this lens cap um, is the stock lens cap that comes with it, but uh, Dan and Bob Smathers, who are were the first assistants on the movie, uh, 3D printed um, new lens caps for the front, new lens hoods, so that because this was, if you can believe it, just that was too much. Uh, we needed to lose that much to be able to clear yeah, the, safely. Yeah, the ejection envelope is kind of starts from the bottom where the feet and it goes backwards at an angle and when they drew the line it went right here. So this much was too far. The top was fine because it was coming at an angle from down and it would go like this, the ejection path. So we took unscrew this lens and then we 3D printed a little plastic ring that would just get rid of that hood and make it flush there. So now uh, this is pretty much it for the front end. They wanted as little as possible. You know, we usually shot at five, six and a half to eight. Yeah, depending on the same Or sometimes. eight and two thirds. If we were using the Loxia, which was the longer lens, uh, which was kind of like the tight single, we would usually go about eight and a half for that. So we had custom mounts made in the cockpit. The Navy basically said, these are the screw holes you're allowed to attach stuff to. And then we put the cameras and then we figured out what like pieces we had to machine <clears throat> so that the cameras would be where they needed to go and attach to the F-18. And the Navy basically had to supervise anything that was made that was attached to the plane. But once we got that interface, then we had a little bit more flexibility to figure out you know, exactly how to put the cameras. So we had one here and one here on the pilot on both sides. And then... And then for the front facing. From the front facing, there was a tall one on top and then there were three uh, Venice's just without uh, raw deck on the bottom. This is really specialized to Top Gun. I feel like 90 plus percent of the time, if you're going to be doing a car rig or anything, you're going to want control over the lens. And therefore you're going to probably strip away from something this stripped and go to something over here or somewhere in between. So we're going to move on to the backpack now. So this is our backpack mode, and also, you know, it's somewhat like this for car rigs as well. Um, this is what we use the Rialto for most of the time when the operator just wants to run around with a camera and um, not have a big thing on their shoulder because then they could go up, they could go down, they could, you know. A lot of flexibility in tight spaces tight as spaces. well. Um, and then every job is different and there's never really a right or wrong way to do the backpack. Um, typically we've done jobs recently where we live in a backpack mode. So there are certain things if we were switching back and forth between a normal camera studio mode and a Rialto mode, we might do things a little bit differently. Like we have some accessories that are just bolted straight onto the backpack. But for me in an, a backpack mode, that's really nice. And so it's great to have either the operator or an assistant carry that around uh, while the operator is running. And and um, and if we hop to a head or we hop to dolly, we just hang this backpack on the sticks or the dolly and just click this right into a head. And functionally speaking, if you jump back and forth a lot, it just makes sense from a time standpoint. Also with like car rigs, this is great when you're rigging the camera because technically this back end could just live out of the way and with the Venice 2 now you have even more space you could leave this in the back of a car and just use the tether to just put the camera wherever you need in the car if you had to turn around it was it would be easier to do when you were in this mode yeah I mean with with trays on the side of cameras hostess trays they call them um, footprint is always a big deal and if something smaller like this is really helpful so that things can be closer to the car and also if you're doing free driving um, you can do mounts on the hood or mounts on the dashboard without having to impede the actor's vision which I think is really helpful and that's what's great about the size of this um, and the footprint. So and a lot of comments you get from say DPs or operators are that you know it, the Rialto is so small why do you have to add all this stuff? So we want to kind of build the camera in a way that is practical on set because the Rialto looks great when you just have a lens on it and a handle, but in terms of being super usable, 
the operator has to see the frame, you have to pull focus, the, you know, we have to adjust exposure, and then usually there's some sort of focus assist. So this is kind of how we like to build it, so it's a really small envelope. And that's another great attribute about the Venice with all the NDs, internal NDs, you don't have to switch ND as frequently as you used to, so the, the need for a map box is really relative to the cinematographer. So we are going to convert from studio mode to Rialto backpack mode. So you're on set and the operator wants to go handheld in a tight space. Uh, this is something we have to do. Uh, we try to keep things simple, so everything we try to stick to uh, 316, 532nd, and 3 mil, so we are not scrambling the tools. And um, yeah, there we go.